Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 28 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my good friend Pervez Ahmed. Thank you, Zaki. Good to be here. It uh, feels like it's been a long, long time. I know it's only been probably just shy of a month, but uh, you know, I know we were trying to do every two weeks. Uh, things came up, but uh, we're back, so that's what counts. It's, exactly, and it, it's only been a couple weeks, but it, it's you know podcast time sort of <laughs> That's stretches. right. So that's right. That's right. We're we're actually recording just uh, one month after our last episode dropped. So. Oh wow. Okay. So, okay. So we will we will drop one month after our last episode dropped. There you go. But uh, regardless, now we've covered a whole mess of different, uh, very interesting issues from a variety of different perspectives. But one topic we really have not covered is uh, the interrelationships between people and how 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 uh, uh, psychology and uh, relationships work uh, here in the American Muslim community, which obviously. Uh, we're no different in that sense, in that their communication problems and things like that are always a going concern. And uh, I know, Pervez, this is something you've been wanting to talk about for a while, and certainly it's something I've wanted to talk about as well. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we as a community are no are, 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 are by, by no means immune from some of the sort of, uh, you know, whether it's uh, traumatic or emotional distress that you know, the greater society and people around us are dealing with. And so certainly we're not immune from that whatsoever. Um, in fact, you know, the rising tide of Islamophobia, you know, being viewed as a minority, being viewed as a fifth column. I mean, I, I imagine those things sort of exacerbate uh, these issues further, you know, beyond just even maybe something we see, quote unquote, in the mainstream. So to that end, uh, I'm super excited about the guest that we have. Uh, Zaki, you want to do the honors? Yeah, so we're joined by Sabine Sheikh, and uh, she is an LCSW, a relational psychotherapist, somatic practitioner, clinical supervisor, and trainer. She views from a holistic mind, body, and soul perspective, and utilizes alternative healing modalities as an important part of treatment. She incorporates an understanding of oppression and intergenerational trauma in the way she works. Sabine has worked both domestically and internationally has worked with a range of populations struggling with everyday relationship and professional challenges, depression and anxiety, to deeper struggles with violence, abuse and mental illness. And as a Muslim and a product of a family who emigrated here, she's also passionate about issues surrounding spirituality, religiosity and immigration. Sabine, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Now, so before we get to all of that, which is there, there's a whole lot there to unpack. We were talking about this off mic, and I would love for you to share how you chose this particular area uh, for a professional and really a personal uh, focus in your life. Yeah, um, as I was saying earlier, it, it really, in some ways, was a convoluted path. Um, I really got involved in politics back in high school when I first heard about the sanctions in Iraq, mm -hmm. and at that point, it just it struck me and really deeply impacted me, and it set my life in the course of getting more involved in politics and understanding the geopolitics of what makes these policies happen. Um, and then when I graduated college, I realized there's nothing I can actually do with a political science degree that would actually make an impact. And so then I began to really look at the kinds of jobs that I wanted and they all required a master's in social work mm -hmm. and so I realized that that's kind of the next path I had to take and I'd already been kind of doing volunteer work on the side related to working with immigrants and refugees um, resettling in the US but this degree really solidified my ability to work more directly with people now I think it's interesting that and before we we get into uh, the your post degree work uh, you made a you came to a realization that involvement in politics was not going to have the same degree of impact that you wanted to, that you for whatever reason you felt it wouldn't be uh, measurable or maybe achievable I mean what what was sort of the the calculation there that you went through um, I think part of it was doing political work although important mm -hmm. wasn't gonna give the immediate impact and alleviate the suffering that I was witnessing. Sure. And I was, I think my soul, my system just isn't cut out for 
for that long haul of work. So I'm grateful for those that do that work, but for me, I think I really needed to focus on helping individuals that were suffering right now. Gotcha. Sabine, um, I, I know you join us, like you're joining us right now from Oakland, uh, where you reside presently. Um, are, you fr are you a native of the Bay Area? I am, and that sounds like such a rare thing these days. <laughs> it, it certainly is. I mean, you're talking on the other line with uh, two uh, implants uh, to the Bay Area. Uh, okay. But yeah, certainly something that uh, I noticed when I first moved here is that you rarely come across people who are native to the area. Uh, you know, yeah, I grew uh, up in very, Fremont. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good old Fremont. Okay, okay, nice. Um, and and Zucky mentioned the fact that you your your parents uh, immigrated here. So India, Pakistan. Yeah. Well, that's even a political complication. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please. India, then Pakistan, but right. roots in both places. Understood. Understood. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I guess picking up, I, I just wanted to kind of give give that as a reference point for 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 folks who are joining. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to the conversation that sort of Zucky initiated or started about uh, some of your work, uh, and then so you did this sort of led you to uh, sort of graduate work after you finished undergrad. Yeah. Okay. And 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 that was in social work in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, masters in social work. Okay. Got it. And so then. Yeah, I mean, how are those experiences like in graduate school? I mean, was it sort of, the, you know, when, when, when you started your coursework, you came to this realization that, okay, this is exactly the kind of work I want to do. Was there some, okay, maybe I need to sort of flesh this out once I graduate? No, it was, it was really clear early on that this is exactly what I needed and wanted to do. Um, I used to work at Islamic Relief at the time I was in grad school. Right. And would often see the absolute necessity of mental health services alongside the humanitarian services that we were providing. Mm. And because of the stigma and lack of importance, it just wasn't included. But it was just so clear to me that it was necessary. And through my internships and through my jobs, it was, yeah. I mean, I saw an impact. And it also, I mean, I think sometimes you can see early on what you're good at. And like pretty mm -hmm. quickly I realized this was my home. This was my niche of what I could do to help the world. Now you mentioned the stigma associated and I definitely want to unpack that. And I know we, we sort of communicated back and forth uh, early on, you know, uh, when I proposed the idea uh, to have you on the show, but, but because that was really one of the issues I wanted to kind of delve into. But um, speaking of that sort of stigma, it, it, did you find that there was a stigma, maybe not you personally, or maybe 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 so personally, but a stigma with even sort of delving into that field of you know whether it's psychology or you know having helping people deal with these sort of emotional traumatic issues? Um, you mean in terms of me choosing that path? You right, right. Uh, well, I'm kind of a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> followed any path uh, that was expected of me so honestly I don't think I really thought too much about that or cared if anyone even implied that it wasn't a smart path to go down. But do you find that there is a stigma associated in, in, in our community? Well I mean I think in the immigrant community I came from the stigma is about income. Uh, so, right. right. Um, I Which think that that probably goes for any major outside of like medicine or engineering, right? So right, and back in Pakistan and India, social workers—it's not a degree per se. Maybe now it is, but before it was just that's what you did as a volunteer. Right. Um, and when you work for nonprofits, before when I first got into the field, nonprofit equaled zero salary in the eyes of my aunts and uncles. Right. So. It was it was more just looking down upon that, but the gender imbalance worked in my benefit in this regard because there's less expectation as a female for me to be making big bucks. <laughs> Interesting, uh, and we can probably talk a little bit about that about, about issues related to gender as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so so you mentioned you're you're working for Islamic Relief. You you saw the need, um, mm -hmm. uh, and then once you graduate. Do you continue working with Islamic Relief like full time, or did your path well, take you elsewhere? No, because Islamic Relief unfortunately never took on um, my proposals. Mm, huh. <laughs> and, 
include uh, uh, mental health. And at that point, I actually had decided that I wanted to work for Doctors Without Borders because they did have a mental health um, arm to their work. Um, but that was a 10-year-long journey because their expectations kept increasing as the years passed. And so I actually just worked with them for the first time last year. Yeah, and, and you traveled quite extensively. And I mean, we'd, we'd sort of love to hear about that as well. But uh, so, so you actually put in sort of 10 years of practice almost before you were able to join, jo join Doctors Without Borders? Pretty much. <laughs> oh, okay. And so you're working... Um, like at, at clinics here in, in the Bay Area or sort of? Yeah, uh, right now I'm working um, full-time at an organization providing school-based services, and I'm providing clinical supervision, which is basically providing the clinical oversight for new graduates from their master's program. You have mm -hmm. to gain a certain amount of hours under supervision in order to get licensed. So I'm doing that, and then I'm seeing a few clients on the side, and then I'm working with a new interfaith counseling center in Fremont um, to help develop and and grow that into a, a fuller project. Wow. So in in terms of where we're at now, um, there there is very much a need uh, for the work that you do. But I also you know, and we we talked at the beginning about how the many of the struggles that the Muslim community is going through in terms of uh, personal and emotional issues are, are, I mean, it's no different that, you know, we're, we're all Americans and we're all dealing with the same stuff. But there's also stuff that is sort of unique to our community. And I was wondering if you could help us unpack some of that. What are some of the unique struggles uh, that you've encountered? Um, well, it ranges. There Some things that may be unique would probably be unique to all immigrant communities. Hmm. Um, in terms of you know, when your when your family is struggling to survive and make make it, you don't really have the freedom and I guess privilege to really look at yourself or improve unhealthy dynamics because you're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. And you're also probably more protective of your family, which means you don't want to talk about your problems outside of the home. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's additional challenges in the Muslim community related to beliefs that are not actually true, but the way in which culture or religion gets warped to serve whoever is trying to warp them. So, hmm. um, you know, using religion as a way to continue abuse or to keep things in the family. There's ways in which you can use religious texts to, to do what you're trying to do. Um, and then there's, I guess, I mean, yeah, I think the majority of the issues that become bigger is because we don't talk about it, and then it just becomes a bigger mess. Now, it is that something that's sort of common, again, in your experiences uh, dealing with sort of people, uh, you know, like I guess the immigrant community, is that something common to other immigrant groups, you know, Muslim, or I'm sorry, I guess non-Muslim immigrant groups as well, or is that something you see sort of uniquely within the Muslim community? No, I, I think it's common in many immigrant communities for various different reasons maybe, but mm -hmm. I think any community that is not the majority um, is going to be critiqued and viewed in a different light and therefore they're going to be more protective of their community and that is immigrant and indigenous like the black and Native American communities also so they deal with the same issues as well well they deal with the same issue in terms of keeping yeah. things within the community to protect the community Right, right. Um, and, and I, I mean, I, I can just see the sort of issues that that relates to, whether it's issues of abuse, um, you know, physical, emotional, sexual, right? I mean, we want to just sort of all keep it in-house. Absolutely. With abuse, with abuse, it's, I think, the hardest because it's so painful to watch people suffering from things that really are not okay, but are so kept hidden that 
you don't realize it until, I mean, sometimes you never realize it. Um, but yeah, sexual abuse is huge. Domestic violence is huge in terms of like things that are kept really quiet and private. Mm. Physical abuse is a little bit harder to keep private because there's usually some sort of outward markings, um, or at least at some point they happen. Right. Um, so I, I mean, I, I guess there's so much, uh, but the, um, I mean, when when I think of abuse, I mean, usually it involves like someone like, I, I guess, either perceived or real figure of authority. Uh, and I know that especially in our communities, whether it's based on religious values or religious teachings, if you will, or cultural values and teachings, you know, we have a sort of authoritarian structure. Uh, I'm sorry, well, yeah. And, and, and that's religious, that's cultural. So does that, does that, play a, a significant role in the type of, I guess, in the kinds of abuse that you see in, you know, that's, that's unique to our community? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I'm, like I'm alluding or I'm, I'm being elusive. Um, so I guess I'll just, I'll just come out and say it. I mean, like, you know, we've had instances of religious uh, leaders. Uh, I mean, certainly right now we have one a rather contentious one going on in Chicago that sort of caught the national spotlight of, of, a, of a Muslim leader accused of, you know, uh, sexual abuse. And uh, that's certainly not unique to that particular instance. I mean, I, there's, I can think of experiences or I issues, sorry, that I've seen in communities that I've lived in, not, not unique to Chicago. So, so I'm, I guess I'm talking about sort of like that religious element. And then also within the family, you know, there is, you know, a lot of these immigrant groups and certainly within, one could argue even within Muslim tradition, uh, there's this sort of almost, whether actualized or, or real, uh, you know, like patriarchy. And so, you know, so I guess that's what I was sort of alluding to when I said, you know, sort of, you know, positions of authority. Yeah. Well, the thing is we live in a patriarchal world. So in some ways it's, it's across the board. Like, if you're talking about, you know, a heterosexual couple married, living in one house, the man is often going to have more power and control because of economics. And so if you throw in culture, he has more. But whoever has power is going to, well, they're not going to always use it against you, but, like, they have the ability to. And that ability allows them to stay in that position also. Now, I think in our communities, in addition to the way in which you want to save and protect your community, there's also this real fear about being on the radar of law enforcement because whether your immigration status isn't, you know, solid or even if it is, there's a lot of Islamophobia. So you're trying to protect your family from a bigger macro entity as well. Mm, mm. Um, which is also why I think when imams or religious leaders do these types of things, that Chicago incident is not an isolated incident, but there's this fear of, you know, it making Muslims look worse than we already do. So we live in a community that's already targeting us. So we don't want to add fuel to that, which I get and I respect. And that's why I hope that as a Muslim clinician, people will know that I'm not trying to add to that. But that also doesn't mean it's okay to continue doing harmful behaviors. Right, right. Um, although, I mean, like, again, not knowing all of the details of that particular instance, but again, just drawing from other instances and, in, 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 you know, uh, I, I guess, like, things that I've encountered in other communities uh, that I've lived in, um, when it's a religious figure, there's almost this added layer of, well, you know, we can't, I mean, there's just no way that that person could have committed these things because they're so, they're so religious, they're so righteous, they're, 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 a, they're a religious leader, they're so knowledgeable, you know, whatever may be the, uh, you know, the excuse, but I think there's that sort of added, quote unquote, stigma for associated with victims having to speak out, right? Because there's this element of, well, they're infallible as religious leaders. So how could they do yeah. something so so heinous, right? And 
Parvez, I, I don't know if it's appropriate to share. For Please. That. No, no. I, I think, I mean, unless you feel uncomfortable, but I... I, I... No, I mean, one of the most heartbreaking stories I heard of sexual abuse was a Quran teacher right. telling the kid that he read better because he had masturbated his teacher before class. Mm. Mm -mm. Like, talk about warping and twisting a religious act to serve yourself in such a harmful way. Right. Like, he had actually associated reading Quran with this act. Right. It's so, terrible. It, the most heinous of acts, are, I think, are being done by people that we expect at least from. Mm. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, wow. Uh, I don't even know how to respond to that other than, you know, again, it, it just sort of goes to, yeah, I mean, it just val validates a lot of what we've been sort of talking about already in terms of, you know, this, the, the, these issues sort of becoming even more exacerbated when we're dealing with people of religious authority, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, within the community. And, and there's, you know, there's issues of like, oh, whether well, infallible or whatever may be the case. But... So so how how, how what's you, so how do people then so what is your advice for people who and, and you know and like and like we keep saying I mean these aren't unique or these aren't isolated sorry instances so what what advice do you have for people who may have suffered or been in situations where they are uncomfortable they may not be sure it's abuse or not but you know what's your what's your advice like how do you knowing again especially coming from yourself like knowing how one has to navigate, you know, the sort of space, our, our, our cultural, or our, our communal spaces that we have. What advice do you have for people who are either victims or think that, okay, this isn't right? I mean, I think the biggest thing I would say is, like, you might think you're alone, but you're really not. Like, this might feel like the worst thing in the world that's happening to you, but it's happened and is happening to others. I think it's so hard because we feel so isolated mm. and we feel like no one's going to understand and that's not the case. And we now, alhamdulillah, thankfully, there's, there are hotlines for Muslims. There's not that many and they've got limitations, but they exist. There are Muslims in the field. There are organizations that you can call and and then there's the internet. There's there's Muslims that have written about their experiences having been sexually abused or physically abused or raped or whatnot. And I think it's important to see those stories so that you can hopefully build up the courage to get support around it. Because I think it's easy to blame yourself or be feel like a victim and feel helpless and hopeless. And I just want people to not feel that level of helplessness and hopelessness so that they can actually get the support needed to get out of these situations or manage them differently if they can't get out of them. Right, right. And and uh, I, I think you I think you bring up a very important point which is that um, it's 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 refreshing or reassuring to see that a lot of Muslim communities now are acknowledging the fact that these things happen and rather than, you know, being that sort of proverbial ostrich, right, they're dealing with these issues. So so they have institutions in place, they have resources in place like yourself, like, you know, others who volunteer or are staffed at, 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 at mosques and centers to deal with these kinds of issues, right? I mean, that certainly may not, may not have been the case 20 years ago. Yeah. Or 10 years ago, even. Right. Things are changing. Right. So, Slowly, but they're still changing. What, what do you attribute that change to within the Muslim community? Is it the fact that Generation Xers have sort of grown up, and the baby boomers, uh, you know, were they the problem, like in terms of denial, you know, not just being a, a river in Egypt, as they say? Uh, well, I would guess it's a lot of factors, but I think, um, I forget if it was earlier in the recording or before the call, but this idea of, you know, the the family members that are just trying to survive, they don't have the the privilege to look at themselves or change these dynamics, but their children have more flexibility and freedom to take on different careers. There's so many more Muslims in the mental health field now, and that's because we have the ability to not only have to survive, and we have that, that economic flexibility. And then there's 
I think the problems are getting harder and harder to deny, and that mm. means they're, that we're being forced to look at them. Um, I think many imams are realizing that these things are out of their scope of practice, and so they're looking outward to get support for their constituents. So I think it's a, a level, layers of reasons why it's becoming more open, but even five years ago when I approached Majid's offering to provide therapy at their centers to now, I think a lot has shifted. And I, a lot of it might just have to do with the fact that there's more people in the field now. Right, I, and I, and I, 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 I think yeah, and we've kind of shifted the folk, or, or the conversation even with regards to talking about imams and religious leaders getting the necessary, perhaps getting the necessary uh, uh, pastoral care, right, right training, and that involves dealing with these kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that has changed as well? Um, that's beginning to change. Um, there's organizations now that specifically provide trainings to imams regarding domestic violence, for example. Um, there was recently a training in Atlanta that taught mental health first aid to imams. So it is happening um, scattered about the country. Okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess now shifting the conversation uh, a little bit, you know, maybe to more sort of personal, uh, uh, on, on, a, on a more personal level, but sort of inner family, or I guess intra-family dynamics and the kind of issues that arise. I mean, we're not just talking about abuse. We're we're, we're talking about um, we're talking about just people who are dealing with, um, you know, whether it's learning disabilities or disabilities of some other kind. Um, you know, again, in your in your not only your training but also your experiences within the Muslim community, are, are there particular issues that you're that, that you're seeing that you find more commonplace among Muslims? You know, I don't know the numbers, but uh -huh. I would venture to guess the exact same problems we see in the non-Muslim community, we see in the Muslim community. Right. There uh -huh. is higher levels of learning disabilities and autism across the board than there was when we were growing up, and that hasn't the Muslim community is not immune from that. Um, and there's, you know, just regular life things. I remember once a family friend asked me, like, what do you do? Why would anyone need therapy? And I was like, well, what's your relationship with your mom like? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I was like, well, do you ever get into fights with her? And he said, yes. And I said, well, those are the kinds of things. Like, it's if you have a relationship with any human being, you could probably benefit from some support because relationships are hard, whether it's your relative, parent, partner, children. It's not like we get a guidebook on how to be with other humans. And so, huh. you know, getting some support or navigating challenging relationships every once in a while, or we live in a stressful world. Like, it is near impossible to find a work life balance, and yeah. that's stressful. So, you know, taking an hour out a week to just have some time to reflect and think about your life instead of being on the hamster wheel could be of benefit. Right, and increasingly families are dual income. So you're not only just talking about one person, right? You're talking about, in the case of a nuclear family with, with, with the husband, wife, and children, um, or, you know, you're, you're talking about two incomes and, you know, people who are having to deal with it, um, you know, not only individually but also as a unit, right? Right. The concept of compromising and navigating to expectations, not everyone knows how to do that on their own. I would say most people don't and you either are lucky and you figure out a way to do it or you're conflict avoidant and that's how it goes or you face it and you learn how to communicate in a different way with a mediator which could be a couples therapist for example. Or parent-child conflicts, you know. There, there's just so many ways in which counseling doesn't have to be this big, scary thing, and it doesn't have to be relegated only to people that have experienced trauma, because right. trauma can mean a lot of things. I think just, I mean, living in this world is traumatic. So listening to the news is traumatic. 
Right, right. Um, and, and so, yeah. So when you met, now you mentioned counseling. I mean, for for those of us who either haven't had the need or haven't had the opportunity to sit in in a session, what typically goes on in like just sort of a a counseling session based on someone who uh, on a patient, if you will, or a client who hasn't suffered trauma, but just like you said, is, is you know, living in this life is, or living in the modern world can be traumatic. Mm -hmm. So just sort of want to talk it out. I mean, what, what normally is sort of like, I guess what, I guess what happens if you could, if you could lift the curtain for us a little bit. Yeah. Well, so a lot of it depends on the therapist. There are so many different types of therapists and different modalities, which I know can feel overwhelming, but there's, there's, I mean, we have the internet, we can research it. So like if you're going to a therapist that does, you know, art therapy, for example, it's going to be different than a therapist that does traditional talk therapy. Mm. Um, but if you went to probably, a, I don't know if it would be fair to say this, but like a mainstream therapist, you know, you go into the room and you may get asked a few questions about like what you want to talk about or what you're there for, what do you want to work on, and then you kind of just go from there. You you dictate and you you guide the conversation, and it can be, you know, some therapists give homework, some therapists just do a lot more listening and pointing things out that you might not realize because you're in it, um, but you know, I had a client come to see me because she'd failed the bar four times, and she was just so stressed and overwhelmed and was just trying to figure out what was wrong. Like, why can't she figure it out? Huh. And, you know, it, it was a little bit more complicated than that when you get to it because there's values associated with it. So it was like values of worth and stress and friendships and all life things that were getting in the way. And, you know, we self-sabotage sometimes without realizing it and anyways it was just kind of working through and picking apart this jumbled mess and that cleared up internal like emotional energetic space for her to then focus on what she needed to focus on and alhamdulillah she passed on the fifth time which is also really rare <laughs> the percentage <laughs> every time no absolutely um as someone who's not licensed in California, uh, and, I, and I am sitting for the California bar in February, um, I might need to uh, schedule an appointment either before or after. <laughs> but that, uh, no, really, I mean, that, that, that just struck such a nerve. Uh, your example, uh, don't even know if you knew that I wasn't licensed in California, but that really just struck a, yeah, yeah, it struck, it really struck a nerve with me. But so, as you can imagine, right. being in a similar situation, like there's a lot yeah. of stress involved and oh, expectations absolutely. of other people and, you know, right. we normally just deal with all of that stress on our own. Right. But, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just there, if you take your car for a tune-up every 3,000 miles, why not take yourself for a tune-up every 3,000 miles? And maybe more often because you're more valuable than a car. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's great. And and I, I think a lot of what you're saying just sort of helps, whether you want to call it demystifying, de, uh, uh, you know, stigmatizing, the stigmatizing. Is that the experience? Anyway, uh, the, the you know the the, the 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 things that people have associated with again going to a therapy session or going to a, a counseling session. So mm -hmm. I, I think I, I think just yeah, kind of hearing you describe the you know what, what what goes on or the kind of or or the kind of quote unquote what we may think as quote unquote mun mundane uh, you know uh, things that people just sort of want to talk out you know mm -hmm. out, talk out loud with you. So and the thing is, we we're so in our heads. And that doesn't. We, that's that's just going in circles. If you're writing it out, maybe it's better. It is often better. Talking it out is even better. But how many times do we talk out about our talk out our most inner deepest fears with other people? Maybe sure. if you're lucky and have a supportive partner, you talk to them. But do you really talk to your friends about the things you fear most in the world? Hmm. No, not. Hmm. But or even finding the yeah. I mean, as I imagine, something Zucky can relate to, even finding the time to talk with your spouse, right, Zucky? I mean, as a father of four, right? I mean, I imagine. <laughs> it's really true, yeah. I mean, it, by, by the time all the kids are asleep and we have time to talk, somebody's fallen asleep already at that point. 
it's <laughs> you know self care is yeah, and the thing is self care does require an investment. It requires taking out time to go to the gym or go for a walk or going to yeah. see a therapist or an acupuncturist. Like it's just the ways in which we have to carve out time in this world in order to survive. And not just li like there's a actually let me rephrase that. I don't think we should just be surviving in this world. I think we should be living in this world. Mm -hmm. And the current way we function is really surviving, just getting through each day until the next weekend. Like that's what that's we want to. Right. And if we're lucky, maybe thrive. Who knows, right? Right? Even beyond living, right? What a concept. <laughs> But you're right. I mean, more often than not, you're just you're just struggling, yeah, or stri yeah, struggling to to, to to. Well, and I mean, to that point, I yeah. mean, you talk about you talk about self care and and uh, time for yourself. I mean, do do things like hobbies play into that? And you know, because that's something I always say is like, even if it's mm. if I have you know 20 minutes before I go to bed to just read mm -hmm. something that's not work related, and I I feel like at the end of the month, hey, I've accomplished something. Or listen to a great podcast. Or, or that. Or recording a great podcast, we hope, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, one of the things that I um, tell my supervisees is that there's a difference between self-soothing and actually doing something that's nourishing. And I think mm -hmm. often what we do is we relax by watching TV or we relax by doing some mindless activity, which is good, it's important, and it's needed but it's actually just soothing our system hmm. as opposed to doing something like hanging out with friends or reading a book or something that's actually nourishing and feeding you. And very often we don't do that. If you have hobbies, that's great. I mean, that is nourishing you in some way. It's feeding another part of you. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I, I, you know, again, <sighs> You, you've, you've talked about sort of like, again, just living in or, or the type of things that we have to deal with in, in, in just the modern age that we live in. One of those things that I can't help but think about um, is, is social media, right? Yeah. And, 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 the factor, and, 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 and the factor that it plays in a lot of the issues that you're talking about. What are you seeing, you know, again, as someone who has been in the practice now for a number of years, but now, right, now you're seeing really this, uh, or perhaps even five years ago, for the last five years or so, five, ten years, where this rise of like social media presence and people having to, 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 to have that, you know, ha have, have a social media presence. What are sort of the issues that you're seeing because of that? That's a great question. Uh, social media is like the devil when it comes to that. <laughs> right. I mean, I like, I've, I've read about things like narcissism and I think that's almost sort of like, a, like people, I think it's people given. get that. Right, it's already given, or people get that. Like, okay, if you're constantly Instagramming and Facebooking and 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 tweeting every you know quotidian, mm -hmm. mundane part of your life, then yeah, you certainly may have issues of narcissism. Mm -hmm. But even just beyond that, right, Sabine? I mean, we're not. It's not just narcissism. No, I mean, there have been articles written about lots of facets of this, but you know, uh -huh. the, how easy it is to compare yourself to other people because. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes sense. You only post the good on Facebook. You're not going to post yourself crying. Sure. But when all you see is the highlight reel, yeah. then it, and you compare yourself to that, especially if, you know, you want a partner but you don't have one or you want children and you don't have one or you someone else has this great job and you're unemployed. Like all of these ways in which other people's lives are being rubbed in your face. Wow. Mm. Um, and then it's even worse for teenagers. My goodness, I can't imagine what life like that was or growing up in that type of environment because there's so much bullying and so much comparing yourself. Like not being popular in high school was bad enough, but now when you have like this social media realm to compete into, that's even you worse. You can't escape it. You can't escape it. I mean, I think it's a great point. I mean, you know, growing up, I mean, I think all of us sort of grew up in the general, general same era. Uh, you know, we we were we had the ability, the capacity to be able to leave our peer group behind, whether it was at school or the mosque or whatever was the case, right? You were able to get away from your peer group. Uh, now we're dealing with a whole new generation of people who are never able to escape their peer group. Whether well, that, it's texting, whether it's texting or it's Facebook, you know what I mean, or it's social media, they're never well, able to. There's that piece, and then there's also before you could have your own identity, like you 
you could have a separate world in which you could be who you were. Hmm. Now you can't do that. So you have to, I mean, people know your business. And not necessarily doing anything bad, but what if your interests are not something that your family or mosque community would approve of? Hmm. You can't really have that privacy or that freedom anymore. Mm. And then, I mean, I, I, well, ironically, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, the, the truth is that that freedom, quote unquote, is one step away, which is disconnecting your social media account. And, and you yet would think that, that's a choice, that step, right? Right. But for kids, I don't think it's much of a choice. Right, exactly. I mean, that's that's the point I was making, is that, that when you think about it, I mean, and not just for kids, I mean, I would say for many people who have any kind of a social media presence, the notion of disconnecting that is extremely, I mean, that's, that's a, a tough hill to climb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, just and and sort of picking up on on what you're talking about, you alluded to this a little bit. In in terms of uh, specifically the challenges posed by by social media, uh, would would you say that the the extra layer of sort of um, navigating identity that comes with being sort of you know being an American Muslim, do you feel that social media has had a negative or positive impact on just w those normal struggles that, that uh, mainly younger people go through? I think it's both. Mm -hmm. I mean, social media, I mean, I jokingly called it the devil before, but it's, it's <laughs> good also. I mean, it's also normalizing. There's a lot of groups on Facebook, so if you, you know, there's, there's various Muslim groups that might act, there's like a skater Muslim group. There's, there's ways in which you can find community and feel less alone. Hmm. And there's ways in which you can be bullied or ostracized or, you know, misunderstood. So it's got its good and it's got its bad. Right, right. Well, and and sort of sort of pivoting off of that, I mean, we are talking about the the American Muslim community. What what are what are some of the? I mean, you've been doing this long enough now. What are some of the big picture? Uh, prescriptions that, that you can think of as far as, you know, just a, a being more centered and having, uh, you know, better emotional health uh, that, that can be sort of specifically applied in, in the American Muslim community? Um, I mean, I think part of it is moving away, and, and this is a generalization, it's not for everyone, but I think moving away from the assumption that religion will solve all. Sure. And I don't mean to say that religion isn't important, but to just say, well, if you prayed more, you wouldn't be so anxious, or if you were just grateful, there's nothing to be depressed about. I think that our Muslim community needs to evolve to understand that there's a lot more nuance and a lot more factors that some that are more privileged may not get. It's very easy to tell someone, you know, pull yourself up out of this situation, but if you've never been in an abusive relationship, you can't speak to that. But we somehow think we can, and we judge people based on that. Hmm. So I think part of it is just like, understand that you don't know everyone's situation, and you can't empathize with it. If you can't fully understand and empathize, then you probably shouldn't be speaking on it. Huh. Wow. Which is, I mean, that's just good advice in general. In the in the age of mansplaining and Matt Damon splaining and you know, <laughs> all the various kinds of splainings that are happening. Yeah, it, it is. And I think in the Muslim community, we really some really do think that prayer and religious you know, so when I was working with Doctors Without Borders, I was working in Chechnya, which is a Muslim, not a country technically, but a Muslim region. Sure, sure. And they have this place called the Islamic Medical Center, which is basically a mental health center, hmm. but it only uses Islamic prescriptions. Oh, uh, interesting. Meaning, like, they prescribe you dhikr, or they prescribe you, like, black seed oil, or various Islamic uh, prescriptions to sure. resolving whatever your mental health problem is. And 
sometimes it works and oftentimes those counselors would be like uh, can you go and see these counselors instead referring them to my counselors who were more trained in mental health related issues because like I think it's common we want our religion to solve it because we believe our religion is really important and right and beautiful which it is but God also gave us these these God gave us medicine and that's sure. not only for biological problems it's for a range of problems and some mental health problems are biological so it just it feels it feels like sometimes we don't use everything that was given to us on this earth and we just pick and choose things hmm. yeah no, I I think, Sabine, you know, and, and we, we certainly talked about this off air, but I, I think you raise an excellent point. And, you know, uh, for the for the listeners, I, I'm, I'm right now in the middle of an excellent book uh, called Spiritual Bypassing, Why Spirituality Disconnects Us from What Really Matters uh, by Dr. Robert Masters. And, you know, Sabine, I, I think what, what it, it's remarkable what you said almost exactly echoes sort of some of the sentiments that are, are expressed in this one passage that I kind of wanted to read uh, and, and sort of get your thoughts on, but you, you took the conversation exactly there. Uh, and, and so Masters writes, you know, any spiritual path, Eastern or Western, that does not deal in real depth with psychological issues and deal with these in more than just spiritual context is setting itself up for an abundance of spiritual bypassing. Again, this idea of using spiritual teachings, whether it's within a Muslim framework, whether it be dhikr or salah, prayer, or reading Quran as a means of coping with real psychological issues, right, and or trauma, or as being the only means of dealing with those things. Mm -hmm. um, that, that That's exactly what spiritual bypassing is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he, and, and it really sort of begins to unpack some of that here. And so I, I think what you're saying in terms of this, what you noticed in Chechnya, not being, again, uh, unique to that region. I mean, I can think of many places in India that operate in the same guise, or Pakistan, or other parts of the Middle East, right, where you go to a a quote-unquote religious person or a, or a Sufi master, and that's where you can get true healing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and again, all of us here, I mean, we, we believe in the transcendental truths that lie within Islam, and so there's certainly a metaphysical reality there that we're not here to maybe either discuss uh, nor can we deny, but at the same time, like you said, I mean, that's not to say that we can't deal with, you know, uh, psychology and psychiatry and therapy and, and counseling that are that are also available to us. Yeah, and I also want to clarify, like, I don't think the Western version of therapy and healing is the be-all, end-all. I don't go. think that we have a monopoly. I actually think there's a lot of problematic aspects to this individualistic approach but mm. I also think that no extreme is the right answer avoiding dealing with feelings and unresolved issues by just praying it away isn't actually going to make it go away it's just going to manifest in how you raise your children or how you treat your spouse so there's an element of it is important to understand things even if it's like you don't need to understand the depth of why you have a painful feeling just so you can find someone to be angry with or someone to blame. Like you can blame your parents till you're blue in the face, but understanding certain things so that you can be accountable and shift and change the way you live your life, I think knowing your history is a is part of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean history in terms of childhood necessarily, but even history of why did this relationship fall apart? It's too easy to blame myself fully, and it's too easy to blame the other person fully. What really went on? And looking through it a bit, not to dissect it to death, but just to understand so you don't repeat it in your next relationship. Right. And whether that relationship is spousal or it could even be beyond that, right? Relationships that don't necessarily end, but you know, you have fractured relationships with your parents or your children or your siblings. Absolutely. Right. The relationships you have in your core family with your caregivers and siblings will 
undoubtedly manifest again in other relationships. That's just that I could show you in a million examples how that will happen. And as, both of you are parents, so I'm sure you can speak to, you know, watching yourself sometimes parent and seeing parts of your parents manifest. Oh, Lord, help us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Zucky, uh, care to comment? <laughs> Zucky pleads the fifth, um, but uh, yeah. So no, I I think I think no, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very 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 valid point, and and I can't, you know, not only with your children, but even with your spouse, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you're turning into your mother, you're turning into your father, right? So and your spouses are often very able to pick up on those things that you may not even notice. And again, it doesn't have to be bad. Our parents right, right, no, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> but conscious parenting. You know, being more aware of why you're doing certain things or conscious partnership, being more conscious of the ways in which you are like your mom or dad. And do you like that part or do you not like that part? And then having a choice around how you interact with the people that you love. Wow. <laughs> now, is, is, there, is there sort of a science behind that? I mean, like, are, 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 the, are the reasons we tend to, uh, you know what I mean? Like, like I guess... Yeah parent like our parents or or uh, or be a husband like our fathers it's it's based it, there is science around it there's research around it but i can just say from my experience it's right. what we know okay mm. how are you supposed wow. to be the kind of father you envision being if the only model you have is your own father sure sure and you know we 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 are attracted to what we know. So if you grew up in an environment in which one parent was super dominant and the other was super submissive, that's the only thing you know. So you're either going to be dominant or submissive and you're going to need a partner who's going to offset that. That's why when people grow up in domestic violence homes, you have a 50% chance of being the perpetrator or 50% chance of being the victim. Like you can't really escape that unless you do your own personal work to change. Left to your own devices, you will be one or the other. Wow. And, and you see that with abuse. I mean, sorry, with uh, substance abuse as well, right? I mean, people who grow up in, in, in families where there was some sort of substance abuse taking place, that behavior often gets repeated. Yeah, you either only know how to cope using mm. substances because that's all you've seen your family do, or you become an enabling person, which allows that behavior to continue. Huh. And, and yeah, it is absolutely manifested in how you raise your children and what kind of children they grow up to be as adults. Right, right. Wow. Um, well, th that's uh, a lot to think about. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm applying everything you just said to my life, and I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> well... You know, <laughs> I think a big part is awareness. Even sure. if you're not changing something, if you catch yourself and and notice it, that is a huge thing. Because then you can apologize to your kid or your partner because you saw that you just did that thing. Right. And that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. So Absolutely. all hope isn't lost. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's a relief. <laughs> can make a huge difference. Right. Um, well, I think that's actually a great place to uh, put a pin in this conversation, but I think uh, there's obviously a lot more uh, depth that uh, we need to plumb here. Yeah, but, and, and to that point, Zucky, I mean, I think something we failed to mention at the outset, but, uh, you know, we should mention at this point is that, you know, we had sort of envisioned this to be sort of an ongoing, um, an ongoing series, if you will, or a conversation around some of these issues. So, uh, we hope that this is sort of part one, uh, and I know we say that about other guests that we've had or other issues that we've talked about, but really, you know, this is going to be part one of a discussion around these issues uh, within the Muslim community, and our next show, the show that follows after this one, um, you know, we, we hope to have someone else on um, who can, you know, provide, uh, you know, their own experiences to some of the issues that we find within the Muslim community as well. But we'd like to have Sabine back as well. <laughs> at some point. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, so, Sabine, I mean, real quick, also, before you leave, I mean, you, you kind of mentioned, you know, your travels taking you to Chechnya. Any other places that you travel to and some of the insights that you were able to gather there or something that you might want to leave uh, 
as parting words? Oh, that's like a whole other conversation. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Traveling, well, then. traveling is um is a way in which I uh heal. It's okay. it's the way in which I heal and grow and learn about myself. So I've I've traveled a lot the last four years as a way in which to find deeper meaning and understanding of myself. Mm -hmm. Um. So there's a lot, a lot that I've learned in terms of gaining perspective on the world and human conditions and human relationships while traveling because you're out of your element, so you're able to see things differently. Right. Um, but yeah, alhamdulillah, I've, I've been blessed to travel quite a bit and I've been blessed to work overseas a bit. Um, I worked um, at an orphanage in Indonesia for a few weeks um, working with the orphans from the tsunami. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, and then also did a project in South Africa on HIV AIDS in in the Islamic world within Africa, um, which was really deeply meaningful. And that was all about destigmatizing so that we could, you know, save lives essentially. Nice. Yeah, yeah. No, and and I think you know we we always talk a lot about the American Muslim experience, but you know one of the things that. Uh, any American Muslim sort of contends with or deals with is, you know, on the one hand, you 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 think locally, but uh, or what is it? You think globally, but you act locally. But mm -hmm. you know, we, there is a sense of ummah, right? The sense of a global community as well. So, so with that in mind, I mean, what are what are things that you see that are that are shared experiences with other peoples around the world, and what are things perhaps that are unique to you know, America, and I don't mean just the Muslim community, just in general. Well, I mean, I think it, it, humans are humans, and human relationships are human relationships. So you can be working um, in a refugee camp, and the main problem someone might come to you about is the boy that's not giving them attention. Um, it's it's really like the interpersonal that is across the board no matter how much someone is suffering from external situations it's the interpersonal that really pains us that's what we suffer from and not to minimize the external but if you're not fighting to just survive from an immediate issue if you, there's even a bit of stability in your life it's the interpersonal relationships that people seem to need the most support with Mm. And those, whether you're living in a sort of, obviously the dynamics may shift, but, you know, whether you're dealing with post-war or you're dealing with just relative, you know, peace, mm -hmm. these are going to be issues that are ongoing. Yeah, I mean, I haven't worked in an active war situation, but in the post-war situation right. I worked in, I went to Lebanon after the war with Israel, I went to Chechnya, um, I even worked after Hurricane Katrina in the south, and all of those were post, not in the immediate middle of. So I can only speak to the post, and the post is interpersonal, is the common issue across the board, in addition to basic needs, of course. But when you move past the basic physical needs, it's the interpersonal that I've seen. Mm. Well, thank you again, Sabine, uh, so much for taking the time to uh, to chat with us today. And uh, as Zucky yeah. mentioned, you know, we would love to have you back on. Um, you know, it, as we wrap, uh, is there any particular places online where people can find you or some of the work that you're involved with or perhaps writing you've done or anything like that? Well, I'm currently actively in the process of developing a website or figuring out how to. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a website yet. It will eventually be my name, sabineshike.com. Uh, but my email address is sabine.lcsw at gmail.com. Okay. Um, and you're okay with people emailing you? I mean, you know, is that is that the best way to reach you if, if they have a question or well, yeah. if someone local wants a session or something like that, perhaps? Yeah, it's the best way to contact me. I may not be able to help or support people and everything, but I can at least point them in the right direction. There you go. Um, there are Muslim clinicians in the Bay Area, and there are Muslim clinicians across the U.S. now, and I'm tapped into those networks. So, um, you know, right. And and you don't have to see a Muslim. Like it, I know for some people it feels important, and for them I support them, but. Clinicians are trained 
to be professional and to understand various various different aspects and traditions and values and you just sometimes have to therapist shop like different personalities are going to click so you mm. just have to sometimes see three or four people until you find the one that you feel the most comfortable seeing mm. excellent um, okay well great well again thank you so much and, and again I'm sure people will, 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 will contact you with questions either about your own experiences or uh, issues they may be facing and again Sabine would be more than happy to kind of point you in the right direction or uh, advise you further so um, I, I you know not only thank you Sabine but I'll also thanks to our listeners for listening um, as always um, you can uh, le uh, please leave us a review on iTunes uh, or you can email us further questions on at diffuse congruence at gmail.com and you can also check out our Facebook page facebook.com slash diffuse congruence uh, please leave, leave us a review star rating every little helps um, Zeki uh, anywhere people can find you online uh, yeah I'm I'm uh, on Twitter at Zeki's corner that's uh, the AKIS corner and also that's my website just add a dot com to that and uh, I really want to thank Sabine for coming on this was absolutely engrossing and I know that many of our listeners will uh, not only benefit from this but will appreciate the fact that we, we're covering this topic. Yeah and please do join us again uh, for part two that'll be the next episode. Inshallah. Thank you both very much it was a, an honor to be on your show. Thank well, you thanks. Sabine and thanks for all the positive feedback that you gave uh, with regards to the show as well that was very, that was very nice of you. Of course. And with that, this is Diffuse Congruence. We will see you next time.